hello, Dr. Bowers. Welcome. Well, hello, Shana. Pete is fine. Sorry. Pete is fine. All right, great. That's how I know you, of course. <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be here with you today to talk about spelling out. Yeah. Um, why don't we just start, though, with having you introduce yourself and your work a little bit? I got into all this first as a classroom teacher, taught grades three to six for 10 years, mostly overseas. And ironically, was a terrible speller all of, almost all of those years, and then ran into real spelling in the ninth year of my teaching, um, at the end of my ninth year of my teaching at a conference, and was rather shocked when I went to this talk that I thought would be a <laughs> snake oil salesman who said the spelling made sense was about meaning and didn't have exceptions. And then within five minutes, he made sense of all these spellings that I never understood. And it kind of turned my teaching upside down and then came back to Canada and ended up getting into doing a master's and uh, and followed with the PhD. And it was in there that I did the intervention study on vocabulary that introduced the phrase structure word inquiry with John Kirby, which was published in 2010. And then I also did a meta-analysis of morphological instruction in that time that was the first one out and that has been corroborated by the others that showing that morphological instruction was helpful for everybody, but in particular had benefits for the younger and the less able, which was not what the general assumption was. Um, and that continues to be reinforced with the following ones. And since then, I've, I, my work is really, I'm not in a university, but I've run, I've started this WordWorks literacy center and do workshops and work with teachers and kids and tutor. And that's what I do. Okay, wonderful. Well, without further ado, let's dive right in. And yeah. uh, the, the, the main topic today um, within structured word inquiry is specifically yeah. spelling out. So can you uh, just explain a little bit about the difference between spelling out and sounding mm -hmm. out and how it's, it's important to the work? Sure, this is a great topic that I'm trying to bring more and more attention to. I, I often say that if I could push a button and do some a research project, it would be looking at the effect of this practice. And there's th different pieces of it, but the overarching title I use is spelling out orthography. And I like that title because we use that phrase spelling out when we don't mean anything about spelling. We say, you know, I'm going to spell it out for you. These are exactly the rules of this game. You know, or you, in, when you say you're going to spell something out, you just mean you're going to explain it. So I like the idea of spelling out orthography because it has both of those senses. But there's three things that I think come underneath spelling orthography that we'll look at. One is I call writing out loud, which is when you are spelling out the orthographic structures of words as you write them. So you writing out loud means you're writing at the same time. Spelling out loud, you don't have a pen, but you are looking at orthography usually and spelling out its structure. And we're when we're talking about its structures, we're, that people might just assume that means morphemes, but no, the orthographic structures are graphemic and morphemic, and then also the suffixing changes. And then the other one that I often use is something I call tapping out loud that has to do with tapping the graphemes in the base. But so those are the three aspects of it. It's, it's nice that it's just one word away from sounding out when you talk about spelling out. And the idea there is that frequently when we're working with a student who we're help, they're reading with us, we're trying to help them with reading. When they when people get stuck, everybody's heard the phrase, can you sound it out? Now, it turns out my experience is that lots of kids do that and don't get to the answer. <laughs> Um, but it's it's an attempt, and it's a reasonable attempt, is the idea is to try and link those letters on the page and how they link to the pronunciations of words, which is an important thing to do. But we need to know what those what are the letters are actually is the graphemes that are writing the phonemes. But the thing about one of the things about sounding out when you're doing with a kid is a, you're, if you're especially if you're doing it with a student who is somehow struggling with reading or new and struggling or struggling and old and dyslexic or whatever, um, when you ask a student to sound out, one thing that is definitely there is they can make it, they can get it wrong. And if you already are traumatized in some way uh, with your failure, 
when you try to sound out, you are you aren't just trying to work out the orthography. You're trying to perform in front of somebody. And if you the more you like your tutor or your teacher, the more embarrassing it is to make mistakes. It seems is what I see. And so one thing that's going on is you're raising the cognitive load in your working memory with fear <laughs> when you say, can you sound it out? Some people are more stressed by it than others, but in everybody, there's that aspect. Whereas what I find immediately different with spelling out is if you're reading with a kid and you're looking at the book and you ask the kid to spell it out, they might think, well, that's a silly thing. Of course I can spell it out. The word's right there. But they, but notice no no fear, no risk. If, if they can name the letters, so there's no risk involved in just spelling out. But the thing that makes it powerful, for, uh, one of the things that I think makes it powerful is that what my sense is when you're reading with a kid and they, you know, we know from eye movement studies that our eyes aren't moving smoothly through the letters of the words left to right. We're bouncing all over the place. Dyslexics bounce more than non-dyslexics, but we're all, our eyes are really being driven by our mind, which are, which is a pattern seeking device. And we're jumping ahead and jumping back and noticing things in a way that's not conscious to us. But if you are reading and you're, and you're weak at it, you probably see this part of the, text that's coming that you kept bouncing off of but didn't make sense of and so the very common thing that i'm sure your listeners will recognize is you know you ask a kid the kid's reading they might you might not even ask them to sound out but the the word is uh knight like knighting shining armor and they say kite or something like they just guess based on the first letter and my argument is that when that happens it's partially related to the stress of making a mistake where you don't want to leave a big pause. You just want to say something quick. And then we've discovered as learners that, well, if I make a mistake, the adult sitting next to me takes over and starts guiding me and I do what they say. Or if I happen to guess it right, they don't notice and I keep going. If you ask them to sound, write it out loud, what I always argue is a way of having your eyes walk your mind through the orthography of the word before you guess. Right. And because what I'm suggesting is that when people make their first guess, they haven't actually processed the orthography that's sitting on the page because they didn't get it. They just shouted. But if you name the letters, I just see it so frequently that teach kids, even who have no background in the details that we're going to be talking about, about announcing graphemes in the base and the affixes quickly and the pauses at the all that, even before you know anything about that. Um, I have teachers regularly tell me, oh my God, it works half the time. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you spell it out, if it turned out to be a word that the kid doesn't know, there was no sounding out that was going to help. And there was no spelling out that was going to help if you don't know the word. Now, if you know some of the parts of the word, however, you recognize this base, but you haven't seen it in this combination, ah, that might trigger something that will get you towards the word um but that's the, the the starting point is it's the easiest actual shift that i can think of in terms of level of complexity for the teacher just to try when a kid is lost yeah, just try say spelling out and see what happens because it's not hard it's just that we have to undo a habit of saying sounded out all the time but we can get into some examples if that that might help unless you had something else to ask first absolutely yeah let's dive into okay. some examples so um, let's take this idea with the, this word. And of course, the word's action. Now, if, you, if, a kid, if that was in um, a pa pa sentence a kid's reading, and it doesn't really, it's, doesn't, it's not a sight word yet, it's not automatic at all, there's many things that they might say. They might go action or something like that. Um, and if you just say, oh, could you spell it out? They could do it. They could spell out the structure right or wrong, but the teacher knows what the, the structure should. I, I want the teacher to know what the structure is. And if they go A C T I O N, ah, I just said A C T and then an I O N. And one thing that we need to know is that there is an I O N suffix, and the word spelled the spelled A C T is a base of the word action. Now, sometimes people will spell it out A C T I O N. 
because they have this TION in their head that they've been taught about, but turns out not to actually be a morpheme. But just by what I like to do is leave the space where the kid spells it when I when I write it. So whether they made the space there or they made a space there or they didn't make any space at all, they went A-C-T-I-O-N. I can just write it down, but then I can draw their attention to the fact that, well, notice... I, if you say the ION separately, that's a suffix that we've seen in other words. Do you recognize what that is? And if they don't, I can, oh, that's the word act. Like you could you could act in a play. You could be an actor. And if you do that, oh, I guess you're making an action in a way, right? But I don't know what an act is. So right away, I'm I'm showing that if we think in syllables here, we lose, we destroy the meaning connection to its base. And I don't want to infect your mind with TIONs that aren't always misleading you from what it's built with. And if you just didn't pause at all, if you just named the letters, I could say, oh, very good. You named the letters perfectly. And here's my favorite joke with kids. When, you know, it's in a class and you ask a kid to say, can you spell that word for me? And they go, A-C-T-I-O-N. And you say, oh, very good. You named the letters, but I spell it differently. Well, now the kids are going, what? What's this guy saying? Because that's crazy. Uh, I, I might use my tapping out now and go, I spell it out, A C T. Iowa and get the kids to spell it out that way. A C T I O N. And then once I've done that, I can draw attention to the fact that I tapped the individual letters in what I'm calling the base now. And so we have that conversation, but there's something very interesting when we look at this word. How would you, how could, if we were sounding it out, I, I said, you know, maybe somebody knows that when you see that that letter sequence you say shun and they might say they might actually say action and you might think well they just said the word they know it but they might not even recognize the word because they weren't thinking about act right they might you know action like i'm i'm just saying i might just be saying the sounds that i expect but not actually have connected it to the actual meaning and another one i see all the time uh, or use all the time is like grumpy when you syllabify it you go grum p and you say grum p but you haven't you might not have noticed the grump we, right so this is an issue when we get kids who are really good call, described as good decoders but not good comprehenders that that can happen because they're not their decoding is can sometimes hide the actual meaning so that's just a quick example with the word action, how I use it to kind of guide the student to where I'm going. Makes total sense. I mean, I, I've been using structured word inquiry for over seven years now yeah. and um, spelling out, it, just like you said, it helps kids dive deeper to get past the surface of what they think might be there based on um, not knowing or being erroneously taught the T-I-O-N yeah. suffix there. Once they learn that the T is part of the base and the I marks the T, shh, they can make sense of both the structure and the meaning and think about yeah. all the relatives and learn so many more vocabulary words in a meaningful way that actually sticks. Right. Now, now one of the things that I, you know, anybody watching this who might be new at this could easily say is like, well, okay, you've told them it's ACT plus ION, but what, how, do, how are they supposed to remember that? And and what's writing the sh and there's still lots of questions right so the thing that one of the things that people are are always curious about is like well they, they might have heard the four questions or they but the the, the emphasis seems to always be on the morphology people think the emphasis is on the morphology because they see the matrix and the word sum that looks like morphology and then they're often well, where does the phonology fit in and then they're often saying and then when we they see the four questions they're, they notice that the the four the it's not until the fourth question that I'm asking directly about the graphemes. Now, that's not to say that that is a not important part. It's a way to and this is what I can explain when we look at the spelling out the thing that is th this is kind of a, a a boring one because the base is all single letter graphemes. So I just if I'm writing out loud, I go a c t i o n. And notice I pause where the morphemic boundary is. I announce the graphemes one at a time, but I say the suffix as quickly as groups. Prefixes and suffixes, we get to say ION, ING, URE, and any double S, and then prefixes like PRE and UN and SUF or stuff. 
And what the, the, the thinking behind that is that um, very much in line with the orthographic mapping idea for Mary it, and all of the theories of reading that I know of, what we're trying to do is build mental representations for the spellings, meanings, and pronunciations of words in the in the learner's mind. Because if you build those representations in the act of reading, you can recognize things more easily, right? And that Perfetti talks about lexical quality. The higher the quality of all of these features the, of words, their their phonological, their their meaning, and their orthographic connections. And also how well those are bound together, the quicker access you have to a word when you're reading or to, to how to spell it when you're writing. So it's the same idea. But my argument is, why would we only focus our instruction on, 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 on binding the grapheme phonic correspondences, why not the morpheme correspondences? One of the things that I've been talking about a lot lately is that it strikes me as very telling that everybody who's watching this video um, is will have heard of the phrase letter sound correspondence or and many will have heard of graphing phoning correspondence but there's no similarly frequent phrase spelling meaning correspondence this is definitely out there in the research um what's his name um uh, there was a there's an art a, a vocabulary chapter by templeton um i can't remember the year that really blew me away that was you know, sounded like so much of the stuff I was reeling from real spelling. And he kept talking about the spelling meaning connection. But it's not a phrase in the in classrooms everywhere. It's not a phrase that, you know, we have A is for Apple, we, we, but we don't have, oh, the ED is it, it, the, the ED is for past you often or, you know, and and that's something that we it's a signal that we're focusing on one aspect of orthography at the exclusion of another. And it's not that we need to replace the other, it's just that we have to bring our attention both to the graphing phonic correspondences and to the spelling meaning correspondences. And the spelling meaning correspondences are morphemic. The key thing is that the morph in English, the spelling has evolved to consistent, to favor consistent spelling of the meaning rep representation, the morphemes, over the spelling of uh, the phonemes, which have such a variety, which is a good thing because it is the only way that we can keep the meaning uh, units spelled the same. So for a couple of examples there, so that's why um, the graphing phonic correspondence is, is the last question, because if you just look at the word action and you don't analyze it and you try to sound it out, lots of things can go wrong because one thing I see a lot of people talk about is a TI digraph that is that writes shh. And you can certainly see why somebody would think that. They see lots of words that have the T and then the I-O-N, and they say shh, but that's not how it is. And I can, it's so easily dem demonstrable because this base doesn't just build action, it builds A-C-T plus O-R and A-C-T plus I-N-G and R-E plus A-C-T. And so what I need to do is make sure since these all were all these words share that base, they share the spelling. And so now I know that I'm saying action, but I don't I don't hear the quote unquote T sound. Well, that's because there isn't a T sound. There's a sh phoneme here. There is a t phoneme in this word, right? And so it's because I can draw on the link to my knowledge of the pronunciation of the word act, that base in a word like actor and acting, where I have that that I can explain to a student who has maybe misspelled a word, let's say like that. So when a kid writes that misspelling, it's successfully writing the letter sound correspondences they've been taught. And so now you have to tell them, ah, good idea. That might've been, that's a good possible graphing phonic correspondences for a word pronounced that way. How are we gonna help them realize that it has to be spelled that way? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to give some links to folks, and one of them has a document like this, which is from a lesson I did with a grade one class. And what we did is we started with the word act. And I, I like to, it's easy to write a sentence like, you know, Vin Diesel is my favorite action movie actor or something like some silly sentence that plants action and actor and acting nearby. 
So hopefully kids notice the spelling meaning correspondence, despite the <laughs> pronunciation. And so we have, we build up some words, we box the bases and we make word sums and we can work with this matrix. But now that we've done that, we can now inspect, wait a second, notice that in the word, when I just say ACT on its own act, sorry, that T is writing T. And when I say actor, that T is writing T. But when I say action, I don't feel it. If you go action and hold on to it, act, sh, sh, what's writing the sh? It turns out the T is writing the sh. And now we can look at this graphing phoneme diagram and see that the default job of the T is to write that phoneme T. But it turns out if it's followed by an I or Y, the T can write sh or ch. And so now we can help the kid link the spelling and the meaning and the pronunciation, not only to remember how to spell action, but to, to activate, so to speak, all, you know, all of these related ideas. Um, so, and then here's just as an image, and this is, I have a document that has this lesson. This is a grade one class where the, actually the word that they asked me to investigate was a transition. <laughs> They were working on their transitions from one activity to the other in the in the day. Well, transit, we were in San Francisco and they knew about BART transit. So we could talk about transit and transition and transitional and notice that T. And then I did the ACT thing. And then the kids are running around the room looking for any words where the T writes T and when it writes sh. And the thing I'd like to highlight is I frankly have not seen the this graphing phonic correspondence, the T is a very t commonly writing the phoneme sh in most programs whose focus is teaching graphing phonic correspondences. And the reason I would pause it is because the only time you really understand this and recognize it is when you analyze it so you know there's no TI because you have a word sum or matrix. And then you also have to collect words that have the same base but a different pronunciation. And so in this way, um, so I've, I've gone from the spelling out to all this stuff, but you see how the spelling out was the first tack to just identify the morphological structure. And we needed to know the morphological relatives before it would be possible to explain the graphing phonic correspondences. It's not that we, there's just no way to do it if you, because TI is a very reasonable hypothesis of a digraph until you see they're not in the same morpheme. And that's one of the things that is absolutely absent the, the classroom instruction I see and tutoring instruction I see outside of real spelling and structured word inquiry is that we don't teach this message that graphemes by definition happen inside morphemes. They always do. They never violate it. You know what a hothouse is. It's not a hothus, right? You, it, and you don't even notice that you know these things, right? But that, so the spelling out is at first tack and then, and actually the writing out loud is so important so that you're engaging both motor pathways and seeing the structure and talking about it. So it's a tr truly a multi-sensory teaching yeah. method. That's also explicit. Yeah. You cover everything. Absolutely. And, and I did yeah. bring up the old chestnut that I, you know, is worth looking at because one of the example, you know, the word does, um, nobody expects anybody to sound it out and we call it irregular. So now you're asking um, kids to remember all those words that are called irregular. Well, one thing we know about dyslexics is we have a very terrible orthographic memory. We demonstrate daily. We don't remember spellings. We don't understand. Right. So now you're actually telling us you, you, you're, uh, yeah, there's lots of words that are crazy. You're just going to have to memorize those. Well, motivation is gone. Like, well, I suck at memorizing these things. Everyone else seems to get it. What's going on? But now if, so if we take a look at this word does, if I ask a kid to spell it out and they go D-O-E-S, okay, well, I could, I could look at it again. And some people will think they see an O-E suffix, but there's no O-E anywhere else that is doing this job. But if the kid spells it out D-O-E-S, I could say, well, Use that word in a sentence. Okay, he does his work. Well, what if I say I, I wouldn't say I does my work. I would say I do my work. Oh, so this is actually D-O for I do my work. 
And then I add the ES. So this is actually D O E S. And what I'm trying to do, not very successfully, is announce the graphene D and O in the base one at a time. Yeah. So now that so now that I have this, I've worked out the structure of it, I would spell it, I would write it out on this side as D O E S. So I'm announcing the graphemes one at a time, pausing at the plus sign and the ES suffix quickly. But we can, why not look at some other words? So I could say, I am doing my work. And I could ask the kid, well, how would you spell the base? D-O. And what's the suffix? So I-N-G is rewritten as, how do you do that? D-O-I-N-G. Okay. Now we can see that that makes sense. But now I can say to you, how do you, per how do you pronounce the base in the word doing? And the kid probably says do. And I can say, how do you pronounce the base in does? And they sometimes are going, I don't do, I don't know. So, oh, say does, does. Say does without the z, duh. Well, that's how you spell D-O in the word does. And that's the thing. Just like, how do you spell the, how do you pronounce the word act on its own? Act. How do you pronounce it in actor? Act. How do you pronounce it in action? Aksh. Ah, because it's the T writing the sh. So we're, we're getting that focused graphing phony correspondence. But and then we can just show how it's totally logical, just like does and doing goes and going. And nobody calls goes irregular. But we call this one irregular and tell kids they don't have a choice. They have to memorize it because it doesn't make sense, because it, I've heard statements in, you know, teacher resources that tell people it doesn't have graphene phony correspondences. Well, of course it does. It just doesn't have the ones you were you were expecting. So the the act of spelling out in structured word inquiry, it uh, I remember uh, hearing you say in one of your videos when you were doing a workshop to some uh, with some teachers in Dubai that you can use it to teach as you've been showing, but you can also use it to assess right. a child's knowledge. Right, absolutely. And so the thing is, once the teacher understands this process. And there's pages that I'll link you to that give you a guide for the process. And there's a course coming up and all that. But um, if you if you spell out this way to your kids all the time, they start picking up on it. And now you can look, you could say, look in a, you have a book and there's the word teacher. I could ask, I could have a little assess. I could have five words in, on a piece of paper if I wanted. They could be whatever. But as I have the word teacher there. And I could just say, oh, could you spell that word out for me? If the kid goes T-E-A-C-H-E-R, I know they're not capturing the graphemes and the morpheme. But if they go T-E-A-C-H-E-R, I know that they know the graph, the digraphs in that word, the single letter grapheme, they know where the pauses and where the suffix is. And so the, their ability to re reflect that. And I do have a couple of videos that lined up I wanted to show you. And the first one is just with a base. So the, the only focus is the graphemes. And we can watch exactly that kind of idea where the student is spells out the letters of the word own and then is recognizing the graphemes in it because they spelled it out. And spell that out loud. O W N. No, no, no. O. No, no. A o W O W N. It's like you can see the gears in this kid's mind actively just crunching this O W digraph, right? And and it, but he didn't notice it, or she didn't notice it, until after saying the W, and then is going back and oh no 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 oh no 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 oh finally gets the O W, and then the N. And then listen to how really wonderfully the the teacher helps it re identify what's going on here. Good. How'd you know that? Because oh. Whoa, yeah. What did you feel? Oh. Oh. Mm. O W N. So you you the kid says because O. Oh. Well, what he means is because of the O phony, right? And then the teacher goes, ah, very good. You hear that O, oh, and then does the phony mm. The O is for the OW, the N is for the N. So you see how absolutely ab directly explicit instruction is, but the child had a role in discovering it. And now that OW is a thing in their head that they're going to recognize in other words. And in some words, the OW is writing O, 
but in other words, is running out like in cow or something. But at least that OW becomes a chunk that they will see, and then you can interrogate what phonemes it can represent. Now, this one is even, I think, more fascinating in terms of how the spelling out guides in terms of thinking about uh, not only the reading of the word, but the suffixing and the suffixing changes. And so he here's another student. The word your finger's on? Mm. Okay, go ahead and spell <coughs> it out loud. T-A-P double the P-I-N-G. Okay, so what's, what is that word? What's the base? Uh, tape. Spell it out one more time. Tap. So the, the thing I would like to note there is teacher didn't say you got it wrong just said can you spell it out and instant self-correction now the, listen to how that correction happened oh how do you know wait there's no e in the final okay and what happened because there was no e the the p's doubled right before what kind of suffix um ing and what does ing start with it starts with a, suff a suffix vowel uh, it starts with a vowel letter. You're yeah. right, exactly. So we would call it a vowel suffix. A vowel suffix. That's right. Okay. And find... So this is t uh, tapping. Good. Find another one. So notice that this process helped him read the word. Tapping and taping. At as a terrible speller and reader, well, not terrible reader, but as a dyslexic myself, I if I was trying to write tapping or taping, 50-50 chance when I was a teacher for nine years. <laughs> but this kid isn't talking about long and short vowels. He's just saying, oh, when he says no E in the final, I love it. It's a suffix vowel. These aren't these, this is not memorized because those aren't quite the way we say it, but it means the kid knows it. And the teacher just uses the language we want to get established, vowel suffix and and you know, no, no final not, not syllabic e or whatever. But the next thing you're gonna hear, she says, go to another word. And I'm just gonna instead of ruining it after, I'll ruin it now. You just the way this kid goes to the next word tells you all you need to know about how engaged he is. Good, find another one to spell out loud. Uh... Planner. I just said, planner, right? Is that the way most kids react when they finish, get one thing right in their, you know, their remedial lesson and they get to do the next one, you know? Now listen to now, having just done that, how much more smooth the language and the thinking is here. Right? Okay, so the base is plan. Okay. Now that's a beautiful little thing from the teacher because the teacher wants the kid to spell the base because one of our conventions is we don't pronounce it. He says, okay, but spell, but so we, we're not pushing them right now, but. And then because E's not final there, it doubled, the N doubled. And then there's the suffix had a vowel. So there's the an ER. Right. And that, that it became planner, okay, not plan. Can you spell out the structure? Where? Of planner. Okay, wait, so P, L, A, double N, ER. And I don't know if you know if you notice there and if the audience noticed, but what you can hear the kid is doing, they're tapping out in the back. P L A double N E R. Because this is notice it's not that the teacher, oh, tap it out. No, because this has become a practice that the kid recognizes helps them. I, kids do it automatically all the time, but you have to teach them to do it. And so you can see how the teacher can have this conversation and work through this all the while I'm saying, doing a brilliant job of orthographic mapping. And I, I can tell you actually, this video and the next one I wanna show you, I got to present in a session in which Louisa Motes and, and Lina Airy were at, and they were both very, excited about the instruction and Ari wrote and told me that, that you know this is absolutely appropriate for orthographic mapping and blah 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 so this is fitting in what the science of reading folks are telling us is just doing things that a lot of folks aren't aware of and so the only the other one i want to show you is with a different student and now in this case we were doing spelling out because the kid wasn't writing that was spelling out loud but you want to get to writing out loud word sums as well, which is really important. But now I'm going to give you one where we're not using spelling out loud when you see the text, but this is one where we are, I'm helping a student. Can you use 
our spelling out and writing out and stuff as a way of helping you correct, you know, identify spellings independently. So there's a kid I've been working with for quite a while. Um, he's doing, been doing great stuff. And what I would do is we'd watch in the, this time we were watching science videos and we just pick words from the science videos because he got a kick out of these science things. And so we were looking at tectonic plates. And so that we just look at the word tectonic. Um, but then I ask him a word that I was hoping to look at, which is the word surface, because we were talking about the tectonics place of the surface of the earth. And so watch how we go. The other one I was thinking about was surface, like the surface of the planet. Could you have a, could you have a go at spelling out surface, like writing out, I should say surface. S U F. Right. With, yeah. Write out loud with your pen. S U R. Sir. So I have to pause again because his first reaction is this S U F. And I hope it's clear. I gave no signal that he was not right. I just said, Oh wait, no, write it out. And he instantly changes. And now we notice he just said, he just said, sir. So we will come back to that, but I have an, I have a hypothesis of what's going on in his head, but we'll watch that again. S U R. F A C E. How confident are you in that one, Charlie? Pretty confident. Yeah, because you got it. And you know, it was great. And I, this is one of the reasons I like recording. Is I think. Can I tell you, you why? Sorry. Can I tell you why? I know? Yeah. Can I tell you why? Because I, I remember shirt and face, like it's the face of the water. You got it. Now notice he says it's like the face of the water. We weren't talking about the water. We were talking about the earth. So he understands this concept of a face of anything. It's the face of the water, face of the earth, face of a person, right? And notice we don't say surface. He has no problem that we say surface. In the word surface, the F-A-C-E base is pronounced fuss. But in when it's a word on its own, it's part of face. And this is not bothering him because this is how we engage with this stuff all the time. And he can explain it perfectly, buddy. And that, you know what was, I, I want, I need to check the video later because when you, I think when you spelled it out loud first without writing, that I think you said, I don't know if you said S-U-R or not. You might have. But as soon as you went. S-U-F. That's right. That's right. Notice the clearness he has of his own thinking. But notice how as soon as you started to write, that reminded you of the prefix S-U-R, and you've been doing so much stuff with prefixes that that S-U-R just came back to you. And then you just, I'm so glad you shut me up because you saw the F-A-C-E for a face. And that is exactly yeah. the spelling of service, S-U-R, F-A-C-E. Why do I keep pushing that T? Surf the face of a, a surface is the face of something. So, um, yeah, I just think that it's it's just striking to see what what young kids can do. And of course, this is a kid who was not reading at all when I served work, work in grade one and really miserable. Didn't even know his letter names um, confidently. And it was in fact. Um, the first time I have a, a point to another link to work with with Charlie, um, the very first lesson I did with him, um, I, I was re I read a story I was reading with him. He's looking at the text while I'm reading on Zoom, and it was the Phantom Tollbooth, which is a favorite book. Um, a book, there's no way he could possibly he he wasn't reading at all, let alone reading a book at that level. But I just want to get him into a story that's fun, and we're enjoying the story, and then I just pick a word. And the first word I picked, I had planted because it had an ing suffix in it. And I wanted to see how we would spell it. And that's, I don't remember what the word was, maybe jumping or something. And it was, he was still belaboredly naming the letter names. And he didn't actually, he couldn't name the name of the letter I. So I had to tell him, oh, that's J-U-M-P-I-N-G. Let's spell it out. J-U-M-P-I-N-G. And I get him to do that. And so I do the whole thing that every word has a base or a base with something fixed to it. J-U-M-P is the base. And we can add this I-N-G, like jumping, running, playing. Okay. So we're getting that established. But see how I use the spelling out to do that. And then I, and he's going to say the I-N-G. So I say, okay, Charlie, I'm going to keep reading. Okay. Now you look for any other words that have an I-N-G suffix. And he catches the next one right away. Oh, there's one. And 
he said, and we look at, okay, let's say it's playing. Ah, so let's see if we can remove that ing. Well, if I take off the ing, I get play. Oh, play playing. Run, run, yeah. So that one works. You find another ing suffix. Good. And then the next one, though, and I had planted it this way, is there was one that was an ing at the end of a word, but it wasn't a suffix, a word like king or spring. And exactly as I hoped, he's, oh, there's one. Ah, let's look at it. And as I'm doing this, I'm making word sums on the screen, of course. Is it, well, what's a spur? Oh, there's no, oh, so you can have an I and ing at the end of a word, but that doesn't mean it's a suffix. And now we're into the other stuff, uh, other suffixes, prefixes. And now anytime there's a base with a digraph or a trigraph, we're announcing the digraphs and trigraphs, and he's off to the races. And about four or five lessons later, we started making morphine charts and he would look for them and add to them at home with his mom. And then somewhere around fourth or fifth lesson, uh, we hit a word with a rare suffix, something like a double E or something, or just, a, I don't mean rare, it's one that most people don't know about. So employee, refugees, that, something like that, uh, for one who does that thing. And anyways, we work it out. And I say, well, Charlie, I bet you don't have a double E suffix on your morpheme chart. And he goes, mom, we got another one. And he runs back to his morpheme chart and he puts up his double E. Now, the part, and then I say, but then he says to me, well, Pete, look at all the suffixes I got. And he starts naming off his suffixes, N E W -S, S L Y M E N T, just blah, 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 blah. Notice, the, and you have to name them fast because that's the only way we've ever done it. And he's he got like 20 of them. I, oh, that's great, Charlie. And then later I talk to the mom and I say, have you noticed the utter transformation in Charlie's ability to name letters? And he, she laughs because a teacher had just been talking to her about that saying, oh my God, right? So how did I get him better at naming letters? I got, I did not, what I did not do is give him flashcards, practicing naming abstract letters. That isn't going to hold for him. But what I can do is give him, what I was able to do was give him his first experience in any traction on this writing system, but his traction needed a bigger chunk and not only a bigger one, a meaningful one. Right. And so he could have access to that. And in the process, we're talking about what the graphemes are doing, right? The I of ing. Okay. The I is writing I. Great. But he couldn't link the phoning grapheme correspondence of the I in jumping. He didn't even have the name of the letter. Right. So this idea that, and this is one of the things that I'm trying to emphasize is that when we do this work, we are trying to, oh, I, I see what I did. I, I made this. Oh, no, it is right there. So, when this is the theory that my my supervisor John Kirby and I put forward um, in 2017, which is this idea of morphology as like a binding agent, and that's building on Perfetti stuff. It's also very similar to Airy stuff. But what we're adding that isn't in those is recognizing that we have this reading triangle that everybody's you know is very familiar, and the idea that we need to link the spellings of words, the pronunciations of words, and the meaning of words in the mind so that you have instant access. Well, what John and I argue is that, well, there's only one part of the language system that has spellings, pronunciations, and meanings, and that's morphemes, right? Meaning, and I, when I say meaning, I mean in the content and function sense of words, right? That that we're, that, you know, syntactic meaning, right? Um, so we have this helps us do it. A lot of people are arguing that you have to do this before you can bring in the morphology. But my story that I just gave with Charlie was he couldn't do this. So what I did is I drew links between the spelling and the meaning, which engages his meaning, which is he's got no problem in meaning making. And then that made sense of the phonology. And so I, my argument, you can go any way. You, you don't need to go through morphology, but you can. And every time you go through morphology, you are bringing meaning into the abstract spelling and pronunciation part, right? You can't deal with does if you don't think about morph. There's no way to explain the grapheme phoning correspondence of does if you don't understand how it's mediated through morphology. There's no way to explain the grapheme phoning for correspondence and action if you don't go through morphology and it's not about instead of graphing phony correspondence it's about improving understanding of graphing phony correspondence so that was a long spiel <laughs> no it was wonderful and 
you know, it just impresses upon me over and over again, the confidence that kids build right from yeah, the very yeah. beginning when you introduce mm -hmm. them to spelling out. Like, I can learn these letter names. I can learn how to spell. This is all making sense. And they celebrate that. Yeah. And and that's the, that's for me, you know, you hear me say a zillion times that nothing motivates like understanding. And, and so, you know, Charlie was, a, you know, he was traumatized by, because in so often the case, he's a well above average intelligent kid. So he's used to being smart which only makes him feel worse when his neighbors can all read and he can't. So it's in a weird kind of increased harm because you're used to being, it doesn't fit with your identity, right? And, and, and so when you finally give him some traction, it's the first time he felt like, oh, I might be able to make sense of this. It, the motivational change is the quickest of all of it, but you can't build well-integrated mental representations of schema if you if the kid doesn't want to do the things you're teaching them, like even if you're pointing at accurate things, even if you're doing good things, if the kid isn't engaged, they're not changing their synapses, right? right. Um, there's one thing that I wanted, I'll, I'll share. And what and those watching um, should, you know, you can freeze the thing. We're not going to read the whole thing. But I think this, uh, this uh, part of this article, the end of the this article on the effect of morphological processing and reading aloud um, is a lovely way of placing SWI in the context of the research. But, you know, we're, what the thing I highlighted, this is my emphasis, they, at the end they say, important, importantly, poor readers of English often exhibit phonological processing deficits, yep, so that these children may benefit even more by teaching methods that focus on optimal grain sizes of the writing system. Optimal grain sizes is like how the big the bigness of this of the thing, right? Letters have very tiny grain size. Graphemes can be up to three. Morphemes are more, can be more, and they say morphemes. So children might benefit more by methods that focus on optimal grain sizes of the writing system, i.e., morphemes, which would allow a more straightforward mapping between print and sound, in addition to an easy mapping between print and meaning. And that's what we're talking about here and there's another theory out in the research the triple word form theory that's saying the same thing that we can link we, we, that kids can learn phonology orthography and morphology concurrently and in fact that that's my argument is that these are already inherently interrelated where we get into trouble is we take an inherently interrelated system and then we pull pieces out and study them in isolation and just assume that the kids can put them back but it, as we saw with the T grapheme, without morphology, we didn't even notice that it was a grapheme for writing shh. The other comparison that I, I, I make sometimes is like, think about um, medicine before there was anesthesia. And you're a doctor and you wouldn't want to figure out how does the human heart work? Well, you're stuck with, before anesthesia, the only thing you can ever study is a dead human heart. Right. So you have to study with cadavers and you can learn a lot about the heart with a cadaver. You can see, oh, it's got these chambers. It's got these things. You, you can learn a lot. But imagine the difference. The first time doctors started studying a beating heart in a heart operation under anesthesia, because now you see how the heart interacts with the body. And that's what we're, we, you know, so what we're what I'm trying to do is bring the graphene phoning correspondences back into where they belong which is in the orthography system, which is why I use the phrase orthographic phonology to teach how not only what are the available graphene phonic correspondences, but how do they operate in the orthography system? And what and the other point that I try to make is that you know both both phonics and orthographic phonology do something really important, which is teaching what are the available graphene phonic correspondences. It's a key thing that phonics does. But the weakness that it has is it doesn't help you choose which grapheme to use when there's more than one possibility. And if you look at the misspellings of dyslexic students, I think you will find that way more frequently they're writing possible grapheme phoneme correspondence, just not the one for that word. It's like you can't, you know, it, we, we need to have the three pieces and, we're, and the meaning is the only part that links directly to the meaning is the morphology. And so what we find is that grapheme choice is constrained 
and explained by morphology and etymology. And by that, I say I, I like the words constrained and explained because they are literally constrained by morphemes. They can't cross those boundaries. But it's also the grapheme choice is constrained because I can't spell the word action. Yes, the SH is a way of writing sh. Why can't I use the SH in action? Because the SH can't write the t that I need for act, right? I need the grapheme phoneme correspondences that work for the phonology of the morpheme in all of its pronunciations, not the grapheme phoneme correspondence for one word. And when we teach that way, we can, does is as normal as anything. And the weight that is on kids, you know, the, the, the heaviest cognitive load on, on struggling students is feel, being told they have to memorize stuff when, at, that, that they can't memorize. They just don't, we do not have the capacity to remember things we don't understand. But if we understand something, there's no sense that you have to memorize it. You just remember if you know it. That, that was, that's wonderful. So much valuable information um, that you've, you've presented so far. And I'm just like sitting here thinking the whole time of all the children that I've worked with where I've mm. experienced this directly. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's 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 wonderful. You know, it's this this light bulb moment that goes off for them. Like, and it's oh and, and, and 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 what you're getting is this idea. It, it's not just that you're getting the light bulb. You're you're giving the light bulb after they didn't think there was a path, right? And and it's this shift. The idea that oh my god, it might make sense. And it's not like you understand everything. It's just that you can go, ooh, if I can understand that one that I thought was un not understandable, the rest of it doesn't seem so scary. And in fact, the kids love the bigger words, and you get all these pieces, and you and blah, blah, blah. I I had one one story to share. Matt, since you mentioned big words, mm -hmm. um, I have a little girl that I have been so lucky to work with for mm -hmm. for such a long time. I've been seeing her for five years. Yeah. And I started right after her uh, first grade year in, in public school. Then she started homeschooling. Well, she's seen a lot of matrices and, and word sums. Let's just yeah. say that. <laughs> and she's, we, we've been reading the classics. She's in sixth grade now. And um, we came across the word indubitably. Uh -huh. And she is loving that she can read and spell these words. And she, she did so independently. And we, we came across uh, another word that was, you know, equally complex and formal, something she'd never heard before. And she's like, can we do a word sum? So after five yeah. years of matrices and word sums, <laughs> yeah, yeah. she is still very excited to dive in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's, I, there's a couple of places I can just point people to, yeah, to find some of this stuff, but I, I imagine we'll get a, I'll get you a list of links of things that we've been talking about that can go with the video. Great. Um, but, um, one thing uh, that I'll point out is that a whole th ser oh that that's not the spelling out loud. There is a spelling out loud course coming up, um, but my website is full of stuff. Here you can find the link to the spelling out loud course, and there's a another tools of SWI. But the spelling out loud page, which I should show you how you find because my website's a bit crazy, is when you come down here. There's a pay a place that has free resource on spelling out which will take you here and that gives you a guide on spelling out processes and that videos those two videos we just saw but then more and more videos of this uh stuff in action this one is with my son reading but in the first week of reading where i'm using spelling out um so that i i highly recommend checking that stuff out one of the links will be to this article which i think is one of the most accessible articles to accessing this work um but i do recommend that if you've been interested in this that this uh spelling out course is coming out on september 20th 27th but this video will be around after that so you can the lots of resources to go look at this practice and and i've just found it, it i it's in every course i do because you can't i can't write a word sum without spelling out right like um but this one is the only course, where, the general course you get some detail, but it's too big to do with everything else. Um, and it, I, in that in that course, I show how I think it links to cognitive load theory um, in multiple ways. Um, so I'm really, I really appreciate you highlighting this aspect of this work.
Absolutely. And I, and two, you, these classes, that you, these workshops with these, uh, you know, themes or, you know, specific themes, they kind of rotate, right? So if you miss yeah. this one, then there's always going to be another one coming up, right? Right. And if you, yeah. when, when you see at my website, one thing is you can see stuff that's coming up. Here's links for the descriptions of the courses. And so when people can't take my courses, what the way my courses happen is somebody says, Hey, I can't make your courses. Can you do a course on X or Y? Get a couple people together. We plan it around their time. Um, and while I'm here, you should check out this video from Marie and, and myself that is not really spelling out, but I think you'll get a kick out of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Well, well, thank you, Sean. Um, and oh, the other thing we have to say that you are a regular contributor to is the Monday sessions. So absolutely. every Monday at my 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is an open Zoom. People come, ask questions. Um, kids will sometimes come with parents, teachers, blah, blah, blah. So that there's always a chance to ask more about this. Yes, absolutely. Free. And there's always, I, I still learn even, even now after seven me, oh, me, years. It's one of my favorite ways to learn too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's always nice to see new people popping in there. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah. Thank, and thanks for your, you, your, all your work and your website and, and the Facebook group. So I'm excited to see all this stuff growing. My pleasure. Me too. Likewise. All right. All right. Cheers. Cheers.